Jeremy, good morning. Happy Friday. And Happy welcome. Friday, Cole. <laughs> hey, go ahead and introduce yourself to my audience. My name is Jeremy Gordner. I'm a reporter with the Chicago Tribune. I cover state government um, from the Illinois State Capitol in Springfield. Um, you know, as the state government reporter, I cover a um, wide array of issues, anything from uh, the budget, anything from um, just new laws that are passed, um, um, and, uh, you know, anything, you know, from the inspector general's office from the state, which is what I know that we're going to be talking about, um, cover anything having to do with the governor, um, and um, just like, you know, and, and even like other issues that affect anything south of I-80. Um, but because I'm, you know, a Chicago Tribune reporter, a lot of the legislation that I um, write about and cover, of course, impacts Chicago and um, Chicago readers. Um, you know, a little bit about my background. I've covered this beat for about a year and a half. Uh, prior to that, I uh, covered the Chicago Police Department for um, a little over 10 years. So, you know, a lot of a lot of my interest so far in um, in covering, you know, how that dovetails into state government is, um, you know, I've written about the Safety Act um, and how that, you know, that's currently tied up in the courts now. Um, those the Safety Act you know, with the criminal justice reforms wrote a little bit about that on the police beat. Now I get to write about, um, the, you know, those issues from a political and governmental perspective. Um, you know, the assault weapons ban is another big one that's, you know, tied up in not just state court, but in federal court, um, you know, so I mean, that kind of another issue that, dove, that that dovetails from my old beat with this new beat with guns, you know, so um, it's another big issue, um, you know, that I've been covering lately. And um, yeah, so, so those are just like, you know, a couple of the big things that are going on right now on the state government be, um, you know, and of course with um, marijuana legalization, you know, I, I'm sure Cole, you've talked about that extensively on your podcast. Um, and I know you're especially interested in um, the the piece I wrote last week um, from the, um, the state's executive inspector general's office. So again, you know, the, the um, executive inspector general's office, basically they're like the watchdog for, uh, state of Illinois, um, you know, anyone who brings complaints to them, they investigate it. If it, is, it, it usually, it, it'll pertain to uh, state state of Illinois employees for, you know, pretty much any agency, and um, that's what the issue is at hand here. That I'm, sh I'll, you know, that I'm sure Cole, you're going to want to uh, take it away from from me for to discuss that. <laughs> Sure. Well, hey, thank you for uh, introducing yourself and and setting the stage. Um, it sounds like we may I may circle back with you in the future because we've talked about both the Safety Act and uh, the assault weapons ban oh, on the great. show. So I think it'd be interesting sure. to hear, um, yeah. you know, the perspectives you've heard and and everything else. But we'll save that for another day. Um, mm -hmm. Like you said, I wanted to talk about the recent headline story, which for folks that are uh, listening right now um i will put it i will put a link to the story in the episode description uh so that you can go right to jeremy's story um i butchered what i said there a little bit it's a story and what i meant to say was the headline reads five state public health workers kept a yearbook that mocked photos of medical marijuana applicants ig report says and so I'm going to display my screen, Jeremy, um, and and I'll let you introduce the story from here. And again, folks, if you want to read Jeremy's story, you know, as we go through it, I've also got the report pulled up so we can, you know, zigzag if we want to. Um, are you able to see my screen? Uh, uh, I'm sorry. Yes, I am. Perfect. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Perfect. Yep. So I'm displaying the story now. Um yeah, why don't you go ahead and uh, take it away from here? I'm curious, I guess, just to start. So it sounds like you look for these reports all the time, and they just just this right. has come across your desk, and you're like, "Whoa!" Yeah, to hear so, how the... yeah. So every, um, I'm gonna say every few months, the um, the executive inspector general's office for the state of Illinois, they release their um, uh, investigative reports. 
um, uh, they do internal, like I told you earlier, Cole, they do internal investigations on complaints that are lodged against state employees. Um, and uh, they release um, periodic reports on their findings. Um, and uh, so, you know, sometimes when they release reports, is it something that we're going to that that we think would rise to the level of news? Not always. A lot of it is inside baseball, um, not to not to minimize any kind of disciplinary infractions that the that the state watchdog comes up with. But this one was, um, you know, especially, you know, disturbing, you know, considering, um, you know, you, you know, some of the you know, shortcomings that we've seen with um, the rollout of um, uh, the marijuana law in the last few years. This was this 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 wasn't really directly tied to like dispensaries or anything. This dealt more with medical marijuana and just how um, and, and just and, and just basically how, the, you know, the, the state agency that oversees medical marijuana, the Department of Public Health um, was uh, treating it, sensitive information from applicants who were applying to uh, acquire medical marijuana. So basically in um, a couple of years ago, uh, the state watchdog received an anonymous complaint that the supervisor of the um, medical marijuana, uh, medical cannabis uh, division in the State Department of Public Health, uh, Miles Willingham, um, had kept a yearbook, or so to speak, of photos where um, photos of applicants uh, for this medical cannabis program where, um, you know, where these, uh, you, you know, where, where these applicants, their, their photos would be there with captions of you know, them being basically mocked and made fun of. Uh, now, keep in mind, this is a program that caters to a lot of people who are terminally ill and, um, you know, very sickly and um, need to acquire uh, medical uh, medicinal marijuana for a you know, number of reasons. Yeah. Um, and if I might, if I might add quickly, it, yeah. it's a program that started as what was called the compassionate use of medical cannabis. Correct. And right. I don't need to say much further than you know, mocking seems to lack compassion. Anyways, I didn't want to, I just no, wanted to okay. quickly interject. <laughs> no, 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 please, please interject, you know, anytime. Uh, and, you know, William, you know, according to the report, you know, was, you know, it was, it's kind of unclear in the report whether Willingham was actually behind the yearbook because um, among the findings is that everybody, I think, I think the word was quote unquote, everyone in this um, medical cannabis division um, had partaken in, um, you know, contributing to this yearbook. So it's unclear really who started, whether it was Willingham or somebody else. Um, you know, I, uh, and uh, I believe that he um, had denied that he had actually started the year, created the yearbook. I mean, it was kind of going back and forth what in the report, whether he was behind the creation of it or if it was others. But either way, the report made clear that it wasn't just him. It was others who were in the division who um, were apparently contributing photos for, of applicants to this book and then putting, inserting captions, you know, along with those photos saying like, um, they, they, they made some cracks comparing one of the photos to Pete Davidson from Saturday Night Live. Right. They would say like, happy holidays, um, D-A-Z-E, uh, you know, a play on, a, a ploy on, play on being, on words of being dazed, you know, from the effects of marijuana, evidently. And, um, I think there was one that said like, why the long face, which just making fun of evidently just making fun of one of the images. Right. So it, um, so the, this was brought to the attention of the, the state, um, watchdog, um, basically. And, um, and I guess they, uh, you know, they did interviews and, and, uh, um, you know, the, you know, the, and I believe that, uh, you know, employees were at least one employee was saying that this yearbook was made in jest, but there was no official use for it. Um, and Willingham was saying that he did the right thing. He, you know, this book was being shared in the break room of um, an IDPH, of IDPH facility where the medical cannabis unit is. And he claims that he discovered these photos were appropriate, so he removed it. But at the same time, you know, based on interviews um, with other employees, the IG determined, well, no, he was in on it. And and um, just as much as other employees were, 
Um, but what was more disturbing about Willingham's case is that he was a supervisor, obviously, and he should have set an example. Yeah. And did I want to make sure you didn't misspeak there. Did you say that Willingham found that they were appropriate or weren't appropriate? I'm sorry. Yeah. The quote weren't appropriate. He in his Perfect. interview, okay. in his interview, what he was what he was saying is that he told investigators that he confiscated the book, the book from the break area where he, quote, discovered patient photos he felt were inappropriate. Mm -hmm. um, and then but, you know, nonetheless, you know, the IG and their investigation said not only did Mr. Willingham fail to take any action to curtail this inappropriate behavior for approximately five months, he affirmatively affirmatively participated in it. Um, so basically, the state was trying to make an example out of him because he was their boss, you know, basically, and um, wasn't, you know, and, and, and hadn't put an effective enough stop to um you know, passing this around. And, and it's one thing to, you know, make fun of people who were, whose images were in this, um, you know, in this book, but also this is confidential information. So I, I mean, that raises just a whole nother issue about, you know, you know, applicants, you know, to this program and, you know, in, in ensure, you know, it's like, if you're applying for this program, I, I would think as an applicant, you'd want to have confidence that your information isn't going to get shared, um, you know, with the wrong people or shared in an inappropriate way. Yeah. And, you know, it's funny. I jokingly said to a friend, the one the one that said, why the long face? I was like, I'm sure that that was mine because I do not look happy in my picture. And they're like, see, but that's the troubling thing about this story is that you don't know that it's not you. Mm -hmm. <laughs> right. And, and, you know, and obviously the, you know, the the state watchdog in their report isn't going to um, identify who, you know, these applicants are, you know, right. rightfully so, you know, yes. um, but in so many words, it's, it's so many, it, it, you know, but, but, another, but I guess moving on the um, Willingham resigned from his position at IDPH and um, another employee is no longer um, with um the medical cannabis unit. I, I, she was a temporary employee, um, but there were a couple other. Th there were two employees who were part. Who other part? There were five employees total. Willingham basically resigned. Another employee also resigned. She was a temporary employee. Um, as for three others, two of them got each got ten day suspensions, and one got a five day suspension. Um, and. Uh, you know, the one who got a five day suspension basically wrote a rebuttal um, statement, you know, once the findings were, um, fi once the investigative findings were finalized, basically admitting saying like, hey, this yearbook was in poor taste, but since everyone in the med in medical cannabis participated and had knowledge and never complained to it, I com complained about this to um, Mr. Willingham, um, this person said, quote, I never I was unaware that this was an issue. Um, and then basically this employee slam who got the five day suspension slammed the investigation, saying, you know, this investigation was a complete farce since pertinent people were never interviewed and the investigation was not targeted and was not thorough. So that was kind of a parting shot from one of the accused in um, this investigation, if you will. Yeah. I mean, it seems pretty thorough from my perspective, but yeah. I get, you know, they have, they're entitled to their own perspective as well. <laughs> right, right, so. right, exactly. Um, and uh, yeah, so, I mean, it, it just kind of, um, it just kind of, you know, it, it just kind of raised questions in this report. Um, you know, what was unclear is, you know, basically is how long had this yearbook been around? You know, like I said, there was at least one person who, who claimed that Willingham, the supervisor, you know, participated in the creation of it. But, you know, actually we, you know, but then the report also said that everyone participated in it, like I said earlier. So we don't know how long this yearbook had been kept around and it was in plain view. It was in a break room um, at this IDPH facility. So anybody can just go there, have coffee, lunch, whatever, and see this yearbook and they could all, you know, taunt or make fun of whoever was in there i mean it was fair game at that point so who yeah. knows how long this had been going on yeah 
Yeah, I I also noticed that that seemed unclear. Another thing that seemed unclear to me, tell tell me if you had a different takeaway, sure. was you know the the I thought it was interesting that the literal logo was on there. And I think somewhere in the investigation, right. it mentions that only a few people would have access to that logo, perhaps. Am right. I recalling that correctly? Yeah, I believe so. Yeah, yeah. And um, um, which, you know, again, if you're, you know, because obviously with something with something like that, um, you know, one an outsider who sees this would be led to believe that this is an official position of the agency, which clearly it wasn't. Which is, you know, what's, you know, what's very, especially harmful about this whole thing. Yeah, I mean, they, I don't know how, just as a person who's been in positions close to that, how anybody could think that was okay, but I'll keep my opinions to the side. Ooh, Did you right. notice um, something else that one of my friends picked up on? Uh, it, it mentions you know, there's a lot of redacted information, like you say, for privacy sake and, and such. Um, but there was one moment that we're just kind of connecting the dots on. We could be wrong, and I want to preface it okay. with that. Sure. But, um, it says IDPH employee four recalled that she worked with the patient's mother on his application and, the, and that the oh. mother it had sent in the photo approximately earlier. The dots that I'm connecting is this is a minor that maybe they're making fun of. Yeah, that I I can't speak to that. I'd, I'd have to look at that again because right. I could also I could also interpret that as and you tell me because if it's because uh, if marijuana medical marijuana is obviously for compassionate use, perhaps it could be for an adult who is just you know yeah, that's sick, a good point. That's a really good point sick, actually. Too sickly to go through the process on their own. You know that's yep. You know, that, that's the, that's the unfortunate thing with redactions is that it leaves a little bit of ambiguity right yeah so but i mean it, it could be i mean I, I wouldn't rule it out but at the same time it could be the latter it, it could be the latter of what yep. i meant as well you never know but yeah Thank, I'm, yeah I, I couldn't say for a hundred percent certainty i'd have to look again at the report um yeah yeah thank you kind of for affirming that because again i led with saying hey i'm connecting dots perfect yeah yeah no true. i like it. yeah Oh, I and totally you, and I like the yeah. example you gave because I totally wasn't thinking of a case like that. That could definitely be the reality. Right. So, right. Um, right. well, I just want to thank you again for your time today. Um, sure. And thank you for reporting on this. I'm So what other takeaways, if any, did you have from this story? Well, I mean, it's just another example of um, – you know, some of the issues that other reporters have um, covered over the year, you know, over the years since marijuana has been legalized in Illinois. Of course, we've, it's pretty well documented um, about the, um, uh, you, you know, you know, the disparities in terms of, um, you know, the, the lack of, um, you know, cultural diversity when it comes to who's getting, you know, you know, marijuana licenses in this right. state. And this is, that's a pretty well documented thing, which I'm sure you've discussed extensively on your show. <laughs> yeah. <That's>, ad nauseum. <laughs> that's, right. I mean, that's one issue. That's probably the most covered issue I would say, but mm -hmm. um, you know, and then we've just, you know, this is just, you know, another um, example of um, it, it, well, and, and also that's something that governor Pritzker has been criticized about. He was, you know, he was criticized about it um, when he ran, you know, when he ran for re-election, um, you know, uh, that, yeah, you legalize marijuana, but, you know, what about this, this and that? Um, and this is just another example of, you know, of 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 a of, of problematic situation, um, you know, under under his watch and, you know, in um, a state agency that he oversees, um, you know, in dealing with um with uh, marijuana, uh, medical marijuana in this case. Um, so it's just, and then there's, there, you know, there was another report, I think last week or the week before about how um, a lot of these um, uh, um, expungements for marijuana arrests are, it's kind of, you know, there's, you know, while many of these upon legalization, many of these um, marijuana arrests, um, these cases were expunged where there's, it's a, there's a report talking about how it's actually become a very slow process for people to get their convictions expunged. I mean, it's just an, 
this is just another example along the, you know, uh, down the line of um, issues that the state, uh, some shortcomings that the state has had in overseeing that um, um, any, any, any um, uh, policies regarding marijuana run smoothly, basically. Yeah, I'm not familiar with this story. Do you know who wrote it or the headline? Maybe you can send it to me after the show. Um, yeah, I believe it was. I saw it in the Sun Times. While you're looking that up, um, yeah. I'd be interested to hear your thoughts on this contrast that I'm about to lay out. Now, I want to acknowledge two things. Oh, here it is. Oh, oh, oh. here it is. Here it is. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. It says nearly nearly half a million records of minor marijuana arrests were wiped off the books after the state legalized cannabis in 2019, but only a fraction have been completely cleared from the public record. So yeah, that that's what the, this is according to legal aid groups um, uh, across the state. That's what the story was about. And basically what it, what it says is that despite your case getting expunged, there is still a record of a past arrest in, you know, a database, you know, um, you know, particularly a police database that, you know, because because when when people think of expungements, they think of just that, right? They think that your record is wiped clean. Well, n you know, not always. So it's just you know, what happens if you um, if you apply for a job and people want to do a background check on you? There could still be a record of that in the system, even though you were promised of an expungement. Well, this this story um, from the Sun Times uh, kind of you know, it. I mean, in so many words, it it, it kind of uh, touches. And Cole, um, yeah, just to be clear, that when we're talking about uh, expungements um, that aren't wiped clean, you know, from from you know court databases or police databases, uh, what that could still potentially, you know, as a potential consequence, um, you know, if someone's applying for a job, potential employers could find that in a background check. Um, yeah. Um... I'd be curious, maybe just to close, I, I have a contrast I'll paint for you just to get your yeah. thoughts. But um, because you mentioned uh, at the t before we got on air, I think you mentioned, you know, you may be able to speak like at a broad level on um, kind of like cannabis arrest rates and that general topic. And I was just curious, since you just brought up expungements, um, there's the idea of expungements. And then there's also the idea of, you know, commuting a sin commuting a sentence, um, which also happened following the legalization of cannabis. I think the interesting thing between either case, expungements or commutations, I think is the, um, it seems that, and this is just like, I'm asking you your personal, like kind of your personal opinion, but just wondering, you know, what you think about my take here the crimes that we're expunging or the crimes that we're commuting um, still exist today. So like for, for example, I'll just, I just pulled up one co commuting that JB Pritzker did. Mm -hmm. um, and I don't even, I just Googled this, so I'm not sure. I know that this is an accurate story. I just don't know who like reported on this first. Mm -hmm. So um, governor JB Pritzker commuted the four year prison sentence of a cancer patient who had nearly 43 pounds of THC infused chocolates mm -hmm. delivered to his house. Like that's mm -hmm. still a crime. And I know that obviously as a state, we can't do anything about like a federal crime like that when you're getting something mailed to you. Mm -hmm. um, but I just wonder like what your take is on the fact that, and I don't know if the data reflects this, like, most of the crimes that we can't complain about and have put people in jail, like still exists, S still exist. It seems yeah, like I mean, we only like, yeah, we only legalize small amounts of cannabis. So I'd have to look at data just to kind of see what the um, universe looks like of marijuana arrests. I mean, so I could just tell you Chicago in the last few years, if you look at um, data on drug arrests as a whole, they've just plummeted so greatly. I mean, just pure, and not just for marijuana, for every for, for every kind of drug. Um, marijuana, though, I think has a big I'm, I'm, marijuana. The fact that um, the Chicago police numbers for marijuana arrests have gone down, no doubt, um, the legalization of marijuana has had a big effect on that. I'm sure. Yeah. Well, I mean, no doubt it has. I mean, that's been reported. Um, 
but, but what you will still see, I mean, you could still get arrested for marijuana offenses, but those offenses that, you know, the police care about are felt, you know, more felony offenses related to like manufacturing with intent to deliver. Um, you know what I mean? You like, like if it's, if it's still something that you get on the streets, as opposed to a dispensary, for example. I mean, that's something that the police um, generally, you know, still take seriously. Um, so that, like, the, the example that you kind of give, um, it's very interesting. I did not, I have not heard of that example. I don't, I don't know if that's an outlier or if that's something that we see, you know, all the time. Um, because generally, when I think of um, you know, marijuana arrests this, this present day, you know, the, what the police seem to care most about are, like I said, you know, if you're, um, you know, the, the manufacturing with intent, um, from the street level, um, you know, as opposed to, you know, anything yeah. as opposed to just like walking down the street and, you know, you're, um, you, you know, you're smoking marijuana from like, um, you know, from, from uh somewhere that you got it on the street not from a dispensary you know they don't they don't really care about that they care about like transporting mass amounts of the drug you know um, right and that's where i like that's kind of forgive me that's kind of where my question comes from it's like sure. i wonder so like i've heard of instances where people have imported mass amount of cigarettes right because cigarette sure. taxes are super high and we deal with that as like a tax issue um, same thing with like alcohol. If you like go to like a distribution place and you're like s selling alcohol without a license. Yeah. And yeah, so yeah. that's kind of the spirit of my question. Like we're still throwing the law enforcement mm -hmm. at this, you know? Yeah. Yeah. Well, yeah. I mean like, like manufacturing with intent. I mean, I don't know if, if, uh, the example you brought up Cole would apply to that bucket, but in terms of just like, um, I don't, I don't know if it would, but, but I do, but, but, but the way it sounds, it's like, you know, you're talking about quantity and dollar amount. I mean, it certainly would be in the same ballpark as somebody sure. thought with, um, you know, quote unquote, manufacturing and de delivering with intent, you know, in the traditional sense that we would hear about um, from, you know, the drug being, um, you know, bought and sold on the street level, but, but this doesn't sound like that. I mean, that's a, uh, um, you know, just hearing, I, I think, you know, not to sound cliched, I think you'd have to go case by case to really kind of dig in as to whether, um, you know, you know, these are, uh, these cases actually warrant like serious punishment. I mean, but like any drug offense these days, I mean, very clearly, even law enforcement has, like, it's not just marijuana. I mean, cocaine arrests, heroin arrests, they just don't make those big those big drug busts that you used that we used to hear about, you know, 10, 15 years ago in general anymore. Yeah. Well, um, th again, I want to thank you for being willing to talk about these cannabis topics today. I know you mentioned that cannabis is usually not your beat, so to say. So yeah. I appreciate you for sure. willing to go into it. Um, do you have time? Would you be willing or able to give me an update on the assault weapons ban? I've heard that, you know, there's, there's sure. been some recent happenings this month. Um, yeah, so I'm curious. Yeah, so um, so there's like kind of two tiers here, right? I mean, there's several lawsuits that are in state court um, that are contesting that uh, the uh, uh, that the um, assault weapons ban signed into law by Governor Pritzker in January violates the Illinois Constitution, particularly the Equal Protection Clause of the Constitution, which basically, for example, there's a there's a section of the law that um, that uh, um, that's being challenged um, where um, the challengers are saying that, OK, you know, there's certain exemptions for the assault weapons ban that includes like police officers that includes um, military, you know, people who are in the military or active military, but, you know, it doesn't say anything about people who are retired military. Um, and that's, and I bring that up as an important example, because the question then becomes, what's to say that somebody who's retired military isn't as well trained as someone right. who's active military. So as, so, you know, the gun rights ad, gun rights advocates are saying that like, well, that's a violation of equal protection under the state constitution. So um, a lot of these cases have been brought 
to courts in um, Southern Illinois where, um, you know, gun rights is obviously a big thing, you know, compared to Chicago. Gun rights advocates have more of a voice down there compared to Chicago, um, I would say. So, um, you know, so that you're seeing a lot of cases come down there. And then, and so judges are um, ruling in favor of um, the, the gun rights groups, but then it keeps going to the state appellate courts. And um, as, a, as a result, um, you have a couple thousand, about a couple thousand plaintiffs in these lawsuits who... Um, you know, are, you know, temporarily exempt from the assault weapons ban applying to them as a result of these lawsuits. However, uh, Attorney General Kwame Raul has been challenging these lawsuits, and one of them has made it, at least one of them has made it all the way to the state Supreme Court. So I believe next month, um, the high court is going to hear arguments over that case, and we'll decide, we'll see what happens with that. Um, and then you have the federal court where you have uh, several lawsuits that are challenging the ban on the grounds that it violates the uh, Second Amendment of the U.S. Constitution. So, um, you know, so far there was there's one federal case in the Northern District of Illinois, which is in Chicago, you know, Chicago, that has upheld um, any kind of temporary effort to set aside, you know, to set aside the assault weapons ban. But there's um, several lawsuits that were consolidated in Southern Illinois um, that were heard, arguments were heard last week before a federal judge in East St. Louis, who is um, going to basically take that case under advisement um, as to whether, um, as to whether a lawsuit, uh, as to whether the, the assault weapons ban violates the second amendment, and um, if the if if the judge decides that it likely did, then um, this is called a temporary restraining order, which basic that that's what the um, the plaintiffs in the case are asking for a temporary restraining order. Which, if a judge grants that, what the judge would be saying is that if if these if these plaintiffs were to continue with a lawsuit in the courts, they would likely be successful on on their arguments that it violated the Second Amendment. So. Whatever happens, though, if they side with if that judge sides with the plaintiffs um, or the defendants in this case, which is Pritzker, um, Attorney General Raul, um, it's going to be appealed. Um, you know, so and, and the thing and the thing that I should say, too, is that the federal cases have a direct pipeline, have more of a direct pipeline to the U.S. Supreme Court. So I think what we're going to see some legal wrangling for for some time and. I think that the overarching thing I should tell you, Cole, is that I think because of all this legal wrangling on the federal side and the state side, there really isn't, it's really questionable about um, how much this ban is is going to be enforced, if, if at all, you know, in the, in the coming months, while judges on the federal and state levels sort all this out. Wow. Thank you for the rundown. Um it's been very interesting to follow along with. And like you say, with the way that it's working, I feel like the clock's running short on it being possible to enforce, frankly, because from what I understand, they were supposed to launch or they are supposed to launch like the database or whatever come fall. But you know how things work. Well, yeah. yeah. Yeah, go ahead. Sorry. Oh, no, no, go ahead. I, that was yeah, no, it's, it's, it's interesting <laughs> you say that. So, I mean, the way it works is the way it works is like this. You know, you have sheriffs and just law enforcement across the state who raised a lot of concern about that because, um, I mean, we did a story um, within the last month, I want to say, about how um, about 90 of the of Illinois' 102 sheriffs basically issued a, a letter saying that they're not going to enforce the assault weapons ban on constitutional grounds and uh, on, on grounds that it violates the second amendment, which I mean, yeah, I mean, you know, law enforcement take, they, they take liberties sometimes on what they can and what they will and won't enforce. You know, I've never seen the sheriffs in Illinois take such a strong stance like that against any law where they felt compelled, where, you know, close to all of them <laughs> issued a letter saying they weren't going to enforce something. I've never seen that before. So there's a lot of very strong feelings about this case on both sides, you know, including, especially 
Um, on the gun control side, of course, given you know the mass shootings we've seen as of late um, in Nashville, and and of course many of them, you know, Highland Park, of course, which prompted the assault weapons ban legislation, and of course, um, not to mention the gun violence we see all the time in Chicago. You know, um, so there's a lot of high emotions with this law, and um, and as far as like you know, back to um, you know, as far as like in for you know, the sheriffs argue back to the sheriffs, this whole idea of um, not enforcing, um, you know, with the registry that you mentioned, you know, the, the sheriffs, a lot of these sheriffs look at it as criminalizing law abiding citizens. But the thing is, is before, you know, before, you know, such a registry would have to be in place, the Illinois State Police has to set rules Um you know, that, that's like the second step here is like, yeah, a law went into effect. But then the next question is to law enforcement is how do we enforce this? I mean, are we going to go door to door to do this? And the answer is no, nobody is saying that sheriffs and law enforcement, other law enforcement are going to go door to door because the Illinois State Police, they have to set rules for how law enforcement is going to enforce this. And they haven't even gotten there yet. So, I mean, it's like to your point, Cole, I mean, I, it, what is it? It's it's April 21st already. That, that part of the law is supposed to go into effect um, um, in October. I mean, I think it's really going to depend on, you know, what outcomes we see out of the courts on the state and federal level. I mean, I think that's going to dictate a lot. I mean, if, if not everything. Yeah. And so by... My next thought here, and this is a question, you know, kind of to you, I'm just curious how you view this subject, because, um, again, I just I find it fascinating. And, and so one of the things that I hear firearm advocates say is they, they actually point to Chicago and say, look how strict the gun rules are and look at the gun issues they have. Now, look, I'm not going to get into that because I think it, at a certain point that argument like I'm not saying that I don't see the the point in the argument, but it's starting to feel cliche. I hear it all the time. So let me I here's where I actually feel some validity though to that argument is like drugs have been illegal in Chicago sure. for how long and how easy is it to get drugs in Chicago? So yeah. um I'm just curious as somebody who covers this, how do you do you view these efforts as as futile, especially considering, hear me out, this is what really I saw this um, report by a journalist who you may be aware of, uh, Mariana Van Zeller. She does mm. this show called Trafficked, and she and she talks about how different things are trafficked. One of the shows or one of the topics she recently covered is ghost guns. And what yeah. I realized in watching that, I was like, oh, my God. You can grow pot in your basement, and now you can grow guns in your basement. Mm -hmm. You can't well, control this. So, like, yeah, oh, yeah. No, no, it's interesting you say that. So a couple thoughts on that. I mean, ghost guns, if you look at statistics, and I, I'm speaking in Chicago, um, uh, I mean, it's really, so the way that Chicago keeps track, Chicago police keep track of ghost guns or, or quote unquote ghost guns, it's really hard to get the entire universe of ghost guns because the way that they're um, calculated in the data, um, it's called unserialized guns. So an unserialized gun could be anything, it, it could be any gun without a serial number, which could also not just mean ghost guns, it could mean, it could mean any kind of guns that were created before 1968, when, um, you know, the federal database was created, um, you know, for, for ATF to keep track of guns that are serialized, right? But yes, I mean, but but by and large, if you look at the number of unserial, non-serialized guns that have been recovered by Chicago police, that number has gone up over the last couple of years. But the thing about it is that if you look at those, we're talking about, there's probably a couple hundred of those guns that have been um, confiscated by Chicago police um, each year for the last couple of years, I want to say. But that that is a that that comprises an extremely small percentage of, you know, the thousands of guns that they recover each year. You know what I mean? Like ghost guns that are recovered are they comprise and, a very small percentage. Um, 
but 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 nonetheless, I mean, there have been law. You know, there was a, a state law that basically required any ghost gun in Illinois to be serialized. If you know, and then I, I believe you know, and in, in bars the you know you're basically not allowed to have one you know if you do have one it's got to be serialized but um but at the same time now to your larger question though about um just you know few whether it's futile i think there's a couple of schools of thought here i mean you know you know it, and it's been a long it's 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 been a big talking point you know for years i'm in law enforcement and also like gun control advocates i mean illinois borders indiana wisconsin it, they border states that have gun laws that are less strict than Illinois. So the flow of getting guns into Illinois is easier that way. But if you look at stats, a lot of guns recovered by police still come from Illinois or, or, or originate from, you know, federally licensed dealers in Illinois, you know, um, still, you know, but nonetheless, a lot of guns come from Illinois, from Indiana, Wisconsin, you know, border states. So, yeah, there's a lot of guns, illegal guns that make it to the streets of Illinois, but, but, you know, one of the things to look at, and I saw some great reporting on this recently is, you know, for the thousands and thousands of guns that Chicago police recover every year, if you look at the clearance rate for actually, sh you know, shootings that have been solved, it's so minuscule, like they're recovering all these guns, but they're not arresting the shooters in other words. Um, so that leads to a question about, well, why do people carry illegal guns? And, you know, a lot of the times there's just, I mean, it's just for protection. I mean, you know, it's, there, there's, there, there's areas of the city where, um, you know, people unfortunately are struggling to, you know, walk outside their house every day and, and, and then people are scared, you know, I mean, that's, you know, just from people I've, I've talked to who've been, um, you know, people I've talked to who've been arrested, you know, for gun possession. I mean, it's not, you know, you're, these are, you know, these defendants are not all like hardened criminals, you know, I mean. Right. I mean, in yeah. fact, just to give a quick cannabis example, you know, sometimes you hear about people manufacturing to with intent or, or delivery with intent to sell or whatever, and they had a gun and it's like, it's not that they were like out with the cannabis looking for somebody to shoot. In fact, I look at it the same way that cannabis is legally required to be transported in the state of Illinois. I'm pretty certain that a legal requirement is not only the the you know the vans have GPS tracking and cameras and all that stuff, but somebody has to be armed in that vehicle. Mm -hmm. to, so the two people transport it, one person armed, and that's the state's advice. And so again, I look at like cases like that, you know, like hypothetical cases like that. I'm not pointing to any specifically. It's like right. this is maybe just a young entrepreneur who doesn't have a license, <laughs> so he's just trying to protect himself, like you say. Um, right, right. Yeah. And, and and that's the thing is, um, you know, in all fairness, though, too, um, you know, when you say, is it futile that, you know, with again, to your point about is it futile that going after gun, you know, going after guns on the street, is it a losing effort? In other words, I mean, I think that if you're law enforcement, if 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 you know that there are illegal guns out there, you can't ignore that. I mean, there's just, I mean, that's, that's kind of the catch 22, right? It's like you, you still need to get guns off the street. They are very dangerous if they are in the wrong hands. Um, you know, but at the same time, you know, the people who are arrested with the guns, I mean, what are the chances that they are actually shooting people and st stats have shown um, not very good. I mean, guns get passed around in Chicago all the time and it's, it's, it's very hard to track. I mean, you know, CPD has a system where they try, when they recover guns, they try to track where these guns come from by using, um, it's, a, you know, they recover, like when they, it's, they, they match a gun with, they test fire it. And they compare the shell casings, the other shell casings that they recovered at crime scenes. It's it's a um, it's a computerized system called Nibin. It's administered by ATF. And from there, it detectives kind of use this as a tip service where they'll say, OK, well, there's a likely match on the on these shell casings. Um, and then they'll have like a list of crime scenes. Right. Um, where and. Um, you know, where, where the shell casings appear to match. 
So you could kind of tell that, okay, this gun is like this gun that we recovered is likely connected to X amount of shootings. So detectives use that as a potential lead. But then the second half of that is, okay, well, does that always translate into arresting the right person? Well, no, because you got to you got to find that person. You got to find witnesses to to, you know, say that that person did the shooting. You got to find video evidence. You need cooperation from the community, which isn't always going to happen you know if you're law enforcement so there's so many variables when it comes to solving shootings but just but 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 just the sheer act of recovering illegal guns yeah i mean you know that's something that i don't think it's something the police can ignore but at the same time you know you're yeah you're, you're not going to arrest people these are not always hardened criminals and these are not always the shooters that you do want to get off the streets yeah, well, thank you for for getting into that topic. Um, very insightful, and I look forward to maybe having you back on again in the show when um, maybe here in a few months. I'm sure there will be more updates uh, with regard to not only the assault weapons ban, um, but the safety act, which I know we didn't get into today. We'll save that for another for another time. Um, Jeremy, thank you so much. I want to mention again for my audience that your story that we discussed um at the beginning of the show is uh in the show notes do you have any recent i can ask you off air um if you have any recent stories on the assault weapons ban i can link that as well so that folks can read up i don't know if you do yes but... last last week i was in east st louis um covering the oral arguments of the um the federal the federal cases that were consolidated before a, a judge in southern illinois um and that case is taken under advisement um, by the judge to determine whether the um, the assault weapons ban likely violated the Second Amendment. So that story from last week um, basically um, centers around the, the arguments from um, the, uh, the the gun rights attorneys and from the and from the attorney general's office who's defending um, the, the the assault weapons ban. Great, I'll get a link from you so that I can add that to the podcast description as well. Um, folks, I hope you found this episode as insightful as I did. Jeremy, thank you for your time. I hope you enjoyed your time with me today. I did. Um, Thanks. Cole. Good, good deal. All right. Well, hey, we'll, uh, we'll see you next time. Take care, everybody.